Hi guys, it is a hot summer muggy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in Florida on this lovely Monday, February 18th, 2019. But we're going to head up to the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts today where I finally have the great honor and pleasure of speaking with uh, Brad Lister, and if that name does not mean anything to you, it will. Uh, it soon will. I'm sure you have heard, if you're listening to this channel, about the insect apocalypse. And Brad Lister uh, is one of the main people who can talk intelligently about that subject. Just a little bit of background before we bring Brad on. Brad Lister is a research professor of biology at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. His general interests lie in the areas of evolutionary, behavioral, and ecosystem ecology. Most of his field research has been conducted in the tropics. His recent work is focused on the impact of climate warming on ectotherms, we'll have to get the definition of ectotherm, and the Lucio rainforest and the Guanica tropical dry forest in Puerto Rico. And this is where, as you have probably somewhat familiar with, that he has discovered a precipitous collapse in the insect populations down there in Puerto Rico. And he is attributing this to mostly to climate change but we're going to invite Brad to come say hello, and we're going to dive right in to this conversation. So, Brad Lister, come say hello to the folks, and we'll dive right in. Hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks to Sam for inviting me. Okay, so just, just recap, since I believe this was back in, uh, back in October, just tell us a little bit uh, about your own personal story of when you went back to Puerto Rico for the first time in 35 years and what, what you found when you got there. Give us a little background story before we get into the information. Yeah, I had first uh, gone to Puerto Rico to do field research in the Luquillo Forest in 1976-77 when I was at the University of Massachusetts. At that time, we were interested in the competitive interactions between these wonderful group of lizards known as Anolis lizards. There are eight species on Puerto Rico um, and several that live within the rainforest. Uh, we decided that if we're going to understand competition amongst those uh, insect eating species, we should measure their food supply and just see how much that changed between seasons and years. So we did that, and we developed methods uh, actually working in Panama to raise these sticky traps up into the canopy of the trees and to um, then uh, put an array of traps out on the floor of the far forest. And we also did sweet netting back then. So we did that. It was very interesting. Um, there are very few data then and now on tropical rainforest insects. And it certainly informed our study of competition. Well, I didn't think, you know, much about it, I went back to Puerto Rico, but mainly to work in the drier forest in the southwest, Guanica. Um, and then a friend of mine um, who had worked in Puerto Rico a lot when he was a graduate student, he uh, gave me a call and said, um, a bunch of us want to go back to the tropics, back to Puerto Rico, and um, try to replicate the studies we've been doing. Are you interested? And I said, yes, in a heartbeat. I'll be down there with you. So I went back with my colleague Andres Garcia from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, who had worked in Mexico with many, many times. Um, and we began, it went to the same study area, uh, same elevation, um, and we laid out, you know, did the same methods, laid out the traps uh, on the forest floor, raised them into the canopy. And then we were censusing the Anolis lizards again, as I had done in the 70s, to see if there'd been much change in their numbers and biomass. So this was October of 2018. I mean, this was recently, right? No, actually, we went back, Andres and I first went back in um, the summer of 2011. Oh, and then, is that far? Okay. okay. Yeah, then back again in 2012, um, and then for a return trip where we just didn't take any data, we were just, you know, reconnoitering the study area and looking at what we might want to do next. So, yeah, um, so we, you know, we, we noticed 
especially me. Andres had never been in this forest before. There had been many rainforests in, in you know, the Amazon and other places. And the first thing we both noticed was that there just were so few insects flying around. There were virtually no butterflies. When I was there in the, in the 70s, uh, there were hundreds of them around little puddles after it rained, and they were flying through the forest, as you might expect. Um, and now nothing. So we thought that was a little odd. First time we pulled down one of the plates from the canopy and started picking insects off the ground plates, um, after 12 hours in a tropical forest, uh, we quickly realized there was almost nothing on those those traps. I mean, some of them were empty. Others had three or four insects on them. This is compared to the 70s when the after 12 hours uh, out, you know, ready to catch insects, they would be black with insects, mm -hmm. and you came back to pick them, pick off the insects, and put them into you know preservative. So it was striking. We knew something was really, really wrong. So, so obviously this, this is, is, I don't mean to insult your intelligence here, Brad, but <laughs> one of the first questions that. that Doubting Thomases would ask, this was the same time of year that you were down there in the 1970s. Yes. It, back in the 70s, there was a little more seasonality in that rainforest. It's one of the most stable environments in the world, and we know that because back then I checked as many world weather records as I could yeah. find, paired them with Porter, with the with Lukio Forest. Um, and there was there what used to be seasonality. The rainfall was somewhat less in the uh, winter season, um, somewhat cooler then. But uh, the overall rainforest at the top of El Junqui is about 330 inches of rain wow. a year. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, a lot of rain. That's and um, at the mid elevations where we were about 440 meters, it was on the order of uh, 120 to 150 uh -huh. inches of rain a year. So that that didn't hasn't changed. The rainfall has remained the same, but the seasonality is somewhat less. So um, yeah, it was the same um, same seasons in the same month during the same seasons, uh, same elevation. Um, same exact study area. So, but you were not an entomologist going there to look for this. This is just a just something that showed up to just out of left field and, and 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 threw you for a loop. Is that the way I'm understanding this? Well, it did throw us for a loop. Absolutely, Sam. We were astonished by what had happened. But however, we went down there. One of the motiv motivators of going down there was um, Ray Huey and Curtis George and Bronebaker had predicted in 2008 that tropical insects would be exquisitely sensitive to climate warming. Um, they live in a very stable environment where there isn't much change in, in, in the temperatures. Um, and if you increase the temperature just a little bit past their thermal optimum, they fitness will decrease substantially the 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 survivorship and the number of offspring that they have so we were very interested in seeing if that prediction of uh of deutsch and huey and brombaker actually held in a real tropical forest studies had been done in the lab showing that tropical insects indeed were more sensitive to heat and didn't perform well at slightly higher heats but what about a real forest so that's the major motivator for we, why, why we went yeah. down there. Um, and that uh, their predictions uh, turned out to be the case, at least for the Lukia rainforest. We need more areas in the tropics. I mean, there's almost nothing about tropical insects. So I think this is one of the reasons why there was so much attention paid to this paper, because it was so unique, the effects were so unexpected, and the implications are daunting. Yeah, okay, we, I want to get to these implications in a minute, but I want to, the, if I'm understanding what your research, so I, I guess I did, I, I thought it was a lot more recent than it was. So what you were, when you first made this discovery, it actually preceded all this famous um, study, I guess, over there in Germany about, uh, by several years about all the disappearing insects in Germany, by several years, is that correct? Yes, that we, as far as I can tell, um, we preceded uh, the Crayfield study, but it took us a long while to actually analyze all the data and then get it accepted um, by PNAS. So um, that's not not unusual in the business. So yeah, but the, the important thing was that our results were 
certainly in keeping with the Crayfell study, where they had a 76 percent decli decline in biomass of flying insects. They caught them in what are called malaise traps, but they also did their work in protected reserves, um, and they could rule out habitat disturbance as a major factor. Um, it was possible that insect residues, insecticide residues, could have been affecting the insects, um, but really they left kind of opened a question as to why there'd been such a precipitous decline. So we found a catastrophic decline in a tropical forest um, and unexpected, um, and it was in keeping with a lot of other studies. It's not just Crayfield. There are studies around Europe and Britain um, where the coleoptera are down, you know, 70 percent and butterflies are down a huge percent over the past 30 years or so. So this is uh, this recent paper that came out um, in um, biological conservation, maybe a week or two ago. Yeah, I've uh, covered that. Yeah. Yeah, the massive um, database uh, from just every study they could find all over the world of insects and their abundances, um, and it pointed the finger, which most of us suspected, uh, of a worldwide global collapse of insects. However, I think they went a little too far in the tropics because they only had three tropical points. One was ours, mm -hmm. so we need a lot more data from tropical forests. Okay, so it seems like your hypothesis on here, and th this is another thing I want to clarify, you were leaning particularly since you were in a protected area, fairly undisturbed, large hunk of rainforest, well away from active uh, pesticide spraying, you are not leaning towards, I mean, I'm sure you agree that pesticides are bad, but sure. you, your hypothesis is more particularly since I think you're saying that, that Puerto Rico has already exceeded the 2C pre-industrial baseline, and your hypothesis is that at least what's going on in your study is more attributable to this 2 plus C degree rise in average temperature than something is quote easily remediable as stopping spraying is is do I understand that somewhat correctly? Yes, that's correct. And of course, we the first thing you get asked is, well, what about pesticides? So we thought, well, what about it? And we went and got, I got went and got U.S. Uh, agricultural records for Puerto Rico for the use of pesticides, and we were. We're surprised to see how much it's declined since the 1950s. It was about an 80 to 85 percent decline from the 50s until uh, the uh, you know 2010 or so. Um, Puerto Rico had transitioned from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy over that time period, um, and and really most of the agricultural fields, especially in the east, were just left fallow. Um, the forests have all come back, and now. Uh, uh cover the base of the mountains. So yes, the, the pesticides were unlikely. Another thing I found out doing that is pesticides don't have a very long lifespan. Their half-life is on the day is on the order of days, not yeah. not decades. So so you're what what I'm reading this as and again who you're talking to is is a, a journalist. Uh, I mean I don't have any training. I just try to uh, look at other what other people are telling me and figure out you know who is figuring it out and who's crazy basically <laughs> that, that's me that, 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 that's him but but it sounds somewhat straightforward that this is almost a what what I would call a snapshot if, if people are are saying what is it going to look like if the global, planet-wide, the average temperature goes up past 2C, which we all know it's going to, what can we expect? So I, I'm looking at your study as a snapshot of the future. Well, the first thing we can expect is a, is a collapse of insects, and since they are towards the bottom of the food chain, and it probably works itself up the food chain, it's not looking good in a warming world, is the, is the bottom line, is... Run with that for a minute. Do I have it somewhat figured out correctly, or do you need yes, to rein yes, me in? Yes, yes, certainly do. Um, and uh, you're right. Uh, 
it's got to be qualified though and and people criticize scientists and for being so cautious and not saying well something's ever saying something's extinct but i was see, glad to see the the biological conservation article come right and say you know our 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 regressions are showing these insects are going to be extinct 40 percent of them over the next 10 to 20 years so that was a for I'd, I'd never seen that before so we did that with regard to the frogs but the the insects we weren't you know we weren't going to go there because it's just um uh, not uh, how do you know when there, an insect has gone extinct? So we didn't uh, we didn't predict any extinctions, but it certainly looks that way. Um, the the forest uh, apparently uh, is giving us a window into the future of two degrees centigrade plus. It's happening there in Mexico. We also did the same studies back in the eighties for insect traps uh, with Andres and I and. Uh, we went back just to check to see if those populations in a tropical dry forest had also collapsed, and they had was an 85% decline in biomass, um, and they uh, they were um, the, the 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 amount of uh, temperature increase in that area of the west coast of America uh, of uh, Mexico was about 2.4 uh, degrees centigrade, so it was higher than happened in Luquillo. And there was an equally great uh, crash in the insects. Now, how about in Germany? Germany's not up uh, over two degrees, or are they? Well, no, they're not. I don't think they're quite. A, they, they've, they've certainly gone up into the one point something, I believe. But but they found what actually uh, Curtis George Huey at all um, predicted. They found that the uh, when the, when the temperatures went up, that there was actually a noticeable increase in insects and that's that's supposed to happen at least in theory um because temperate zone insects will be um will be uh producing more eggs um eating more food and just being have, having their fitness actually increase by uh yeah. elevated temperatures for a while now that's not going to last forever and once they reach their thermal maxima and thermal optimum and go beyond the thermal optimum, they're going to start crashing as well. Huh. So you, you mentioned a, a, a minute ago about scientists being so cautious in, in sounding, quote, alarmist or, or, or whatever term you want to use. But of course, the Guardian, I'm going I'm to quote you out of the Guardian and and I'm assuming this is a, a direct quote from you ta talking when you were talking about this in the Guardian. This, this article appeared about exactly one month ago. Quote, we are essentially destroying the very life support systems that allow us to sustain our existence on the planet along with all the other life on the planet. Close quote. That is a pretty dramatic statement for a, a cautious biologist to make. Uh, do you regret saying that, or, or do you stand by those words quoted in The Guardian? No, I absolutely stand by them. And actually, colleagues, uh, the, the, the title of our article um, was, uh, you know, it implicated climate warming, but it didn't do it really strongly. We didn't use words like catastrophic effects and so forth. Um, and I got criticized by a lot of people in the business. And I think collectively now with all of the results that are coming in, um, that people have decided that the time is uh, ripe to not, you know, just tell it like it is, tell it like we see it um, and don't hedge your bets because we're in the midst of a global crisis. The impacts on the future of the planet and its ecosystems are absolutely daunting and i think we have to just call it like it is and 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 that is that uh it's it, it it's not going to be pretty in a 2c world to put it it's mildly. not it's i mean the un was right in a way the un report was saying 1.5 is you know, we're seeing a lot of bad effects but but don't let it go to two because it's going to get much worse. And I think they were right. What they didn't mention was that there were plenty of places in the planet, not just the tropics, where we've had 2.0 and above uh, increases in, uh, in 
average ambient temperature. Uh, and as far as we can see, um, we've, 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 we've looked into that, that future and um, we're, we're in trouble um, because, you know, it, it's hard to, it's going to be very difficult to conserve the upper layers of the food web uh, if we can't protect the insects and if they keep, they keep crashing um, and, and, and it's only going to get worse the hotter it gets. So, so yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult problem and a very, very uh, disturbing scenario. Yeah, let's talk about the the uh, food chain and there, there's some fancy scientific term. I want something about the 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 trophic cascades, kind of a backward trophic. Anyway, give us that term and, and try to put that into English about how things at the bottom of the food chain work their way up. Just that, that whole notion, just try to educate us us laymen on that whole process of trophic cascades for a few minutes. Sure. Um, so the trophic le levels uh, start at the bottom. You'd have the producers, the green plants, um, and or autotrophs, as they say. Um, they don't rely on anything but the sunshine. And then above them are... Um, are animals that and other organisms that eat plants. So that would include lots of insects. They're herbivores, um, and they they make their living off of plant food. And then above the, the the insects would be things that eat insects, the insectivores like the frogs and the lizards and the birds. Then above them there are things that prey on the birds and the lizards, and so that would be the first really predator trophic level. And above that, of course, there are things that prey on the things that eat the birds yeah. and the lizards. So, um, and it depends on the productivity and, and you know where you are, how many trophic levels you have. But what we found was once you, uh, and it makes a lot of sense, it's, 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 it's really kind of a no-brainer, that once you um, reduce dramatically the food supply of the insectivores, you're going to see a drop in insectivores. And once you see that drop in insectivores, you can pretty much bet on it that whatever ate those birds, lizards, and, and frogs, they're going to start um, declining as well. So what it's called is an upward trophic cascade. You start at the bottom, you, uh, you reduce the abundance of food, and it just multiplies all the way up the trophic levels to the top. So, and as you mentioned in your article, of course, I mean, you're, you're someone who, who studies lizards, who are the first level of it. I mean, I guess lizards are 100%, except for iguanas, I guess. The vast majority of lizards are insectivores, right? So, obviously, if they, and same with insect-eating birds, so did your surveys, how did your survey of the lizards who eat the bugs what did it look like in your return trip and uh, compared to 35 years earlier? Well, there were three common species in the forest 35 years ago. Um, and one of those species, which was the rarest, but I mean, it wasn't really rare. You saw it quite a bit and there were, you know, we, we marked them, we captured them, and we estimated their abundance of biomass. They had disappeared from the study area uh, within the forest, and that held for about three miles um, in each in each direction, um, east and west yeah. for, from from the forest. So they they just they were just gone. Um, the other very common species back in the 70s, um, called the emerald anole, uh, they had declined by about 75 percent wow. uh, biomass. Um, and also very interesting, we don't quite understand it, but the sex ratios had gone from about 50% females, 50% males, to about um, 20 to 1, 20 times as many females as males. So that sex ratios do happen, in, in, especially in reptiles, as the temperature warms. But this was really, again, an unexpectedly large effect. Um, and finally, the, the major species, uh, the most abundant species of anole in that, those forests back in the 70s, um, Anolis gundlachi, they had declined in biomass uh, by about 50 percent, so they were down quite a bit, but still holding on. But well, we're, I mean, we're talking major. I mean, I, I heard 100 percent on that first one. Um, yeah, well, it's still in the Lucio forest, 
but you have to get into uh, areas where the vegetation isn't nearly as dense um, and there's a lot of sunlight and then you'll find them occasionally but their abundances are, are this particular species are way way down and I also remember uh, reading while I was researching this about the uh, songbirds, the the insect eating songbirds. Uh, one little, this real pretty little bird, I can't remember what it's called, uh, is down 90%? Yeah, that's the Puerto Rican toadio. It's just a beautiful bird with emerald green feathers and a bright, bright red throat patch. Um, and they're they're obligate insectivores they only eat insects yeah. so we were we were very fortunate to have long-term data taken at the uh long-term ecological research study uh area in el verde um that robert wade had been you know, misnetting birds for a couple of decades so we analyzed that data um and there was an overall decline as you expect but we then we thought well wait a second we better try to find out you know what these folks eat because that it's important um and it turns out the ruddy quail dove ate only fruits and nuts so we eliminated the ruddy quail dove and interesting enough the ruddy quail dove hadn't changed a bit in its oh, abundance really? for those 35 years um but the toady that was the probably the biggest insect eater out of the whole bunch of birds that they, they had missed it up in alberti the toady had declined by 90 percent so it just, it, it's not you know, it's not overwhelming proof or anything, but it certainly fits in with the scenario that uh, that insectivores. And that's, you know, Sam, that, that's true of virtually every study in the tropics that Andres and I uncovered for bird censuses. It was the insectivores that were down consistently over and over and over again, down the most. Um, so, you know, that, that fit in too. But again, it's circumstantial. Um, but it did uh, it did get us it get us thinking. Well, so yeah, the bird the birds were were, were were everything was essentially in simultaneous parallel decline with the insects. Everything that ate insects. Well, that's uh, I I mean that makes makes sense. Uh, n to well, I I have a saying on, on on my other channel on YouTube that I don't say here on this one, but the initials are N S S. For for like obviously, uh, you you would expect that. Now now one thing that has the word that has never come up in this conversation that we're however many minutes into it, you have not mentioned the word pollinators. Uh, so it, talk talk about. It sounds like your research wasn't particularly looking at pollinators. But one of obviously one of insects' major major ecological functions on this planet is to pollinate plants. So talk about the pollinators and what their prognosis is, and and the uh, cascading trophic effects of the pollinators going out. Yeah, that that's a centrally important question, um, and we uh, indirectly we took a look at pollinators. I mean. Uh, we often get asked, well, what are going to be the ec economic effects of losing insects all over the place like that? And it says, well, first of all, it, they pollinate our crops and they pollinate, you know, 80 percent of the wild plants. Um, and we're going to uh, probably, if they, this keeps going on, we're going to lose a lot of our main food crops and they're not going to be productive and so forth. So it's going to have an immense economic impact. But in the Lukio forest, what we found was that there was a um, pretty much the same proportionate drop in every major group of insects we looked at between the 1970s and 2000, 2011, 2012, um, which suggested that despite their phylogenetic status despite their evolutionary history despite the niches they occupy and what stratum of the forest they they usually lived in um they were all dropping at about the same rate and that seemed to say to us that there was an overriding overarching um force that was causing the decline of all the insects simultaneously and that included um pollinators included bees included wasps and included lots of beetles um so all the pollinators were declining along with the other groups so the impact of that would be in the forest would be uh 
we don't know because we didn't study that, but it certainly would indicate that we were going to have probably more wind pollinated plants in the future, kind of changing the structure of the forest. Um, it would also indicate that um, there would be a decline in productivity of the forest. So these are all things that um, other people have found that when the pollinators start to go, you get cascades of extinctions, you get decreases in abundance, and you get a change in the plant community of those habitats. But you, did, you were not looking at those changes in the plant communities. Obviously, that would be a, 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 an excellent study uh, for a botanist, for a tropical botanist to be doing. I'm, I'm sure someone is working on it. But of course, all the big worry uh, with the, the quote collapsitarians is what that means for human food crops since everything is done from the human perspective. What is your personal vision of that, uh, uh, of the, the collapse of pollinators? Do you personally have any predictions on what that's going to look like with, with the human food supply as the, as the world warms? Well, you know, already we are half of all the beehives in the United States converge on California every year to pollinate the almond trees mm -hmm. um, because there are no, virtually no bees anymore that, that do the job. So that's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of time of a lot of people effort driving across the country with their bees. Um, I can't imagine that this not where we're going to be in the future with an awful lot of our crops because this this is this is uh, this is something that uh, is almost irreplaceable when you think about uh, maybe the almond grows you can do it but with other you know grains it's just not going to be possible to art to bring in um, you know truckloads of bees that could yeah. take your vast ag agricultural areas so I think it's going to be um, a, one of the one of the biggest problems that we face. Um, economically and in terms of our food supply um, over the next 10 or 20 years. Well, I, I think hand, they, they already have professional hand pollinators in, in China. Uh, that, that's yeah. what they do is go around, I think, with little paintbrushes and, and just go up and down apple trees painting, uh, painting blossoms. So there's a job opportunity here in the collapse of yeah. civilization. Yeah. A, um, a, a, a apple black tree rubber. painter. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can get a job doing that. So let's. What else do I do? I want to uh, to touch on. You know what? One. I just have never heard someone who really knows what they're talking about explain this to me. With all of the stuff that the the, the quote doomers are always talking about with the insect apocalypse, on the other side. I keep hearing all of these doomer collapse stories about the increase in the number mainly of mosquitoes and ticks and how mosquito and tick-borne diseases are, are set to skyrocket in a warming world. So why are so many insects failing to adapt to this and going extinct? while uh, what's special about a, a mosquito and a tick to make them buck the trend of everybody else? Well, that's a great question. And it's, it's, you know, it's not a simple equation in that there are multiple factors impinging upon the abundances of any given insect species, and that will change with, in time and space. Um, so to say that you know, the ticks... Um, I know I've, I've seen the pictures of the, of the moose. Oh my yeah. God, it's it's absolutely sickening. Yeah. Um, and and for human beings as well. I mean, Lyme is just exploding in this country, and in Canada too. It's moved up into Canada, so uh, that alone is a big problem. Um, the the ticks. I mean, ticks. The, one of the major predators are birds, um, and as the birds decline, the ticks. Another trophic dynamic situation the ticks are going to increase oh okay yeah you know that's part of what's going on 
And ticks, apparently, from what I've read, and I'm no expert on, on ticks or insects in general, but um, from what I've read, the ticks are, are fairly uh, resistant to increases in temperature. So they're quite hardy, and they apparently have a very broad thermal niche, as they say, that allows them to uh, take advantage of insects that are declining. I mean, they, they, they will be you know, competing with other insects, other blood-sucking insects um, for, for food, but also competing for the best places uh, thermally, the best places in terms of avoiding predators in the forest. So there's a lot of interactions going on there Difficult to pinpoint exactly what's happening, but I agree it's it's fascinating. The mosquitoes, um, I'm not quite sure uh, if they are exploding. I did not know that, um, but if they are exploding in certain areas too, again, um, they could be. Uh, they're particularly resistant to to warming. Um, it could be uh, the lack of competitors um, and possibly the the a lack of parasites and and predators as their parasites and predators are affected by, by climate change. Well, I think a lot of the, uh, the, the issue with the ticks and mosquitoes, as I understand it, is pretty much just kind of a straightforward thing as, as temperatures warm heading north, that this is just a basic south to north migration of mosquitoes and ticks is just is, is just a lot of the explanation for it, although I'm sure there's many. Would you agree with that that's certainly uh, adding to that whole problem? I would ex absolutely. It's um, a migration up towards the mountaintops is, is mixing a lot of different species and also increasing population densities. So there's a lot of competition and more extinctions, actually. Um, but the other going north to northern latitudes um, and also the uh, effect predicted by Huey et al. and Deutsch that, that temperate zone insects will, will, you, will be increasing for a while. So all of that might be coming into play. Yeah, so, so but what's going on in the tropics, there, there's nobody, as the heat in the hottest part of the planet gets hotter, there, there is no pool of insects to come up behind them. So, no. Yeah, it's, just, I, yeah, it's like the, the opposite end of the spectrum from the north to south migration. Uh, as the ones heading north are getting pushed off the edge of the planet, there's no one left to come up the ladder from below. So, Yeah, for those tropical insects, there's really no place to go except if you live in a mountainous area. And that's one of the, the take-home points, I think, for conservation is that uh, we need... Uh, more reserves in the tropical areas with complex topography because then you'll get the microclimates you need not maybe not to save the insects ultimately but certainly to buy some time and allow these what they call lifeboats or refugia where in tropical insects can can migrate to fairly quickly and they have a, a much better chance of surviving wow. Okay, well, let's move into to the, uh, uh, the, the closing section of this somewhat dispiriting conversation. As, as many of my conversations on Collapse yeah. Chronicles, you can imagine, are I somewhat agree. dispiriting. Brad Lister, what are we going to do about this mess? Well, Sam, that's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, the, if we don't address the drivers, the overarching major drivers of our dilemma here environmentally and, and in terms of the, the global climate, uh, it's doubtful that uh, anything will uh, come of our efforts to, to save insects, for example. Um, we have to do what the UN and, and the World Wildlife Fund and many other People and organizations have been saying, we've got to reduce emissions. We've got to stop destroying habitat. We've got to lower population density. Um, and we've got to do it fast. It's got to be a coordinated global response to the greatest, here's my dog, my great, greatest threat that's ever, ever uh, confronted the human species. 
Yes, your dog is weighing oh. in on the greatest threat to oh. ever. Uh, d- d- that got it going. <laughs> yeah, that got that got him going. She, she's a concerned citizen, I think. I see. No. I don't know who this is outside, but uh, so, anyway, well, we can edit that out, I suppose. No, the the dog barking is. But but what were you saying? This is the you 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 were just saying that. It is this do you, it, when you say this is the greatest threat to the human species? Run, run, by, by this, what is your what is your definition of this? Are you, everything is that an all inclusive this or a particular this? Well, the good question. I mean, it's it's, it's broad and encompassing. The collapse of the natural world and all of the ecosystem services that go with it that we depend upon for our sustenance um, and with that collapse, the collapse of civilization. I mean, we are fast a point, reaching a point of no return. If we don't act quickly, we're going to see what they call runaway climate change. There, and there'll be nothing that we can do about it. It will be on its own trajectory and uh, it will just keep getting warmer and warmer. And as you probably know, you know, runaway climate change is what killed off 96% of the species on the Earth's surface back in the, the Permian. That was the great dying, as they call it, the greatest mass extinction in the history of the Earth. And now they was runaway climate warming. So we can't let that happen. We will destroy the planet and ourselves. Um, and I don't see the urgency yet amongst the governments and amongst the citizens of the planet. A lot, a lot of people are concerned but they don't seem to understand this is a existential situation. So where are you on the pessimistic, optimistic line with, with, with each passing day right here? And I think in your own article, faster than previously expected, it's worse than previously thought, and it's unfolding faster than previously expected. Are we going to turn this train around? Or are we simply going to sit here helplessly, you know, putting band-aids uh, uh, over this while it all goes down? Yeah, I mean, it, it is getting more urgent because we know recent uh, research indicates that the, the Antarctic is melting faster and faster. That is, it's not linear anymore. It's going exponential and climbing faster every year. Same for Greenland. Same for other areas. So there's less time. And we still can keep the temperature increases down to a sub-lethal range where we can um, expect a lot of disruptions in our quality of life, um, a lot of disruptions in the food chain, but not totally catastrophic. Um, and it, it, you know, we're, we have the technologies to to lower the emissions. We we have it now. It would just take a coordinated global effort and some money. To do it and and, and political and individual yeah. will don't 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 forget willpower, which is yeah. the the missing ingredient. Even if we had all of the technological answers, I don't see the will. I mean, I'm as guilty as the rest of anybody else out there. We're all to blame, and you know that's why I think the scientific community has now started speaking out much more forcefully because they know time is short, and we've got to uh, start. Uh, cooperating, we've got to put the investment into it, people power, and we got to have the willpower uh, to 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 do this. Otherwise, um, the the future will be unimaginably degraded for our our children, our grandchildren, our grandchildren's grandchildren, um, and on into the future. Because literally, when I say point of no return, I mean it. it as we lose species. They won't be back around or anything like them for the next 10 or 15 million years. So there's no reversing this once we've crossed a threshold and we've, you know, you reach the tipping point. Um, we are going to have very few options then. So it's time to act. And as the UN report said, we, if we act now, we will save huge amounts of misery and problems in our future. Okay, well, let, let, let's hope the, the UN is right. So as I do with every one of these interviews, and 
I do appreciate you taking the time to do this. But how I wrap up every one of these these interviews, so Brad Lister, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but were instead you actually had the mainstream media uh, talking to you, and they gave you a 60-second soundbite to send out the Brad Lister message to the world and early 2019 what would that 60 second sound like well sam you put me on the spot here but i would say that uh we are at a crossroads we are at a watershed a point of no return is approaching fast um our planet is essentially dying she is on life support um and we are essentially ignoring her she is the womb from which arose all the species over the past four billion years that she has nurtured and they have they've evolved and blossomed into this unbelievable array of incredible life forms um, and we don't know if we're unique in the universe or not but that doesn't matter um, it's our home it's our planet and she's in huge trouble um, we've got to do something and do it fast or we're going to lose everything all the species and ourselves. So I'm praying, hoping, and I'll do everything possible in my power to allow us to not reach the point where our planet is going to collapse and our civilization. Okay, well that was 68 seconds. That was, that was pretty good. You did better, you did, you did better than most people. Uh, Brad Lister, is there anywhere, do you have any sort of regular website or blog that I was unable to find? And, uh, I, I don't, I don't say, <laughs> it's like, it's a question of time, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I wish I did, and I can barely keep up with what's going on yeah. out there, oh, yeah. um, and one thing, one thing we didn't talk about was this amazing paper where the insects were going extinct when they raised the temperatures and pulses. Um, that was in the lab, but it, it's a mechanism behind what's happening globally because the heat waves are increasing in frequency. And we said in the paper, we thought that was probably the most important component of global warming were these pulses of heat that are interfering with the insect survival. So that's another aspect of this. Um, but I don't, I don't, Unfortunately, do Twitter. I don't get out there and Facebook. Um, I'm just so busy and yeah. consumed with trying to do the research. Well, we do appreciate everything you are doing be behind the scenes. You and the few brave scientists who are willing to come out and be honest with uh, with the folks about uh, what what we're looking at on this planet. And so thank you for the hard work you do, and keep up the good fight. Stick around here after a minute, but I just want to wrap it up. So Brad Lister, thank you for coming on and joining us, and keep up the good fight and come back and talk to us if there's ever anything that you think we really need to know. Well, thank you, Sam, and thank you to, to uh, you and all of your colleagues in the media um, for doing such a great job bringing this to everyone's attention. Um, and I really appreciate your asking me to be on the program today. All right. Okay, folks. Well, that was Brad Lister. And come back next week and see what we're up to then. Thank you for listening, folks. Bye.